so I would say for conductors who are just starting out, if they're coming from a symphonic standpoint, let's say they've played the violin, let's say they played the, you know, the cello, the trumpet, and then they're starting to, to work with a singer, you know, how do they do that? The first thing is work with a good translation. So really know exactly what the character is saying in two ways. One is that you could say the sentence in your native tongue. The second way is that you know absolutely every word means. Hey there, welcome to the Conductor's Podcast. I'm your host, Chao Wen Ting, a conductor with over 20 years of experience working with professional symphony orchestras, opera houses, new music groups, and vocalists. I'm also founder of Girls Who Conduct and have mentored hundreds of conductors from across the globe. I created the Conductor's Podcast to share all the behind-the-scenes secrets with you while I interview conductors, musicians, and business gurus from around the world. This is a space created for conductors, conducting students, musicians, and non-musicians who are curious and interested in learning more about the profession, craft, industry, and business. Shy away from the real talk? (laughs) No way! Money, hardship, growth, and the roller coaster of a conducting career are all topics we discuss here. I will give you simple, actionable, step by step strategies to help you take action on your big dream, move through the fear that's holding you back, and have a real impact. Now, pull up a seat, make sure you're cozy, and get ready to be challenged and encouraged while you learn. Hi there, welcome to episode number six of the Conductors Podcast. I'm your host, Chao Wenting, and I'm thrilled that you're tuning in with me today. If you're familiar with the European tradition of a conductor's training, you probably already knew that it focuses heavily on opera. As opera productions were historically why a conductor was needed in the first place. In a theatrical setting, there are many elements to juggle, from staging to singing, from tech cues to the offstage banda. It is helpful to have a coordinator to direct traffic, and the main responsibility of all this became the role of the conductor. In European training, the repetitor, coming from the word repeat or practice, would serve as the vocal coach helping singers to get prepared musically from learning notes to language diction to singing in the correct musical style. Once singers have learned the music well, there are often a few musical rehearsals with the entire cast and the conductor for everyone to get the music polished before beginning staging rehearsals. A staging rehearsal is when the stage director is in charge. They discuss dramatic elements with the singers and decide how to act while singing to better tell the story. The singers also learn the blocking, meaning where they will be standing on stage and how and when they are moving, and all these decisions need to take music into consideration. During this process, the repetitor will be playing the piano production of the orchestral score for the cast and the director, repeating scenes as many times as needed. Hence the name, and it's definitely a lot of repetition. The reason why I'm telling you all about opera productions and preparation is because our guest today, Kristen Ditlow, started her musical career as a vocal coach. She has played for many famous voice teachers, vocal studios, and numerous opera productions before she switched to, or a better word might be added, conducting to the many hats that she wears. In today's chat, Kristen will be sharing with us what she learned from being a vocal coach to arm waving in front of the ensemble, and also her tips for any conductor to starting out and conducting or learning your first opera. Again, if you're listening in a car or at the gym, all resources will be available in the show notes online at chowenteam.com forward slash six. That is C-H-A-O-W-E-N-T-I-N-G dot com forward slash number six. 
Welcome to the show, Kristen. And I can't wait for you to share your story and experience with my audience. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you. So before we get started, though, will you give everybody a brief intro, just a little bit about your background and how you get to where you are now? Sure. So I started as as is the the path often, I think, with a lot of repetitors in, in Europe. I started as a pianist. I've been playing piano my whole life. I started piano when I was five and really took to it very quickly. I added other instruments along the way. So I was a pretty serious clarinet player in high school. I um, also have studied organ. I play harpsichord professionally as well. Um, I did play violin for a while. I was not as good at that as um, as I was at You're the other so instruments. You're so amazing. And I also played accordion, which is also fun. It's a keyboard, so it's that's not so a big jump from um, you know keyboard instruments. But um, and actually started conducting as a drum major in high school. This is not really that that fancy of of conducting. But I did do marching band all four years of high school and and was the drum major. But then um, through high school, I decided I really wanted to pursue the piano, really as a okay. as a pianist. And I had also at that time I was already quite employed. Um, I mean for free, which is you know that's what high school's like. But I played for my high school choir, so I was an accompanist for them. And in fact, in high school, got started running sectionals for the high school choir. So I would, I got my start kind of assisting really pretty, pretty young. Um, so when I was in a senior in high school, I did the a, a traditional route that a solo pianist would do. So I applied to major music schools um, with the gamut of repertoire that a soloist would do. So Bach, Prelude and Fugue, classical sonata, romantic piece, 20th century things. Um, and I ended up going to Oberlin for undergraduate, which was amazing. And then while I was there, I got the first, I would say the first big, big step into the path that I am doing now, which was they had an amazing vocal accompanying double major with the soloists. So with that came a lot of languages. It was like 32 credits of languages or something that I took along with opera scenes and, um, some literature, some very important literature classes, song literature classes. So I got my feet really wet there. And that was so important because I also was playing a lot of, for a lot of pretty major voice studios. Um, a lot of those people are now retired or passed on, but I got to cut my teeth playing vocal repertoire lessons with people like Marlene Rosen, Lorraine Mance, Richard Miller, and, um, and Don May. Which, I mean, that's amazing. As an undergrad? Yeah. Wow, that's such an amazing opportunity. Yeah, so I was I was playing all of those voice lessons a week, really learning as much. So I feel like at Oberlin, I got 10 lessons a week because you're in the other studios, you're gaining, you have your own studies, of course, and then then you're in other people's lessons and you're just, you're just like a sponge. And that's exactly what, I think that's exactly what we should be our whole lives, but especially as undergraduate students, that's what we should be. We should just be giant sponges. So right after, right after Oberlin, I was a little bit like, uh, you know, um, I don't know that I want to do a solo degree. I love playing solo repertoire. I'll get to back to that in a moment. But um, I just thought, I don't know that you can make very much money doing that. <laughs> and I'm the daughter of a fourth grade teacher and an accountant. So they were, they were like, well, you know, be practical. You know, you're a practical person, Kristen. You know, you'll, you'll make a good decision. So I moved back to Philadelphia, started also continuing working with singers. Then I did my master's degree at Westminster Choir College in vocal accompanying and coaching. And then while I was there, also assisted this amazing choral conductor, two of them, actually. I was um, one of Joseph Flummerfeld's assistants for the Westminster Symphonic Choir. And I also worked with uh, Dr. Andrew McGill, who is still a mentor and friend. And so I got to do those things. And then I studied vocal accompanying and coaching with JJ Penna who's now on faculty at New England and Yale and Juilliard. I think he teaches at all those places. So it was, um, it was just this amazing time to be there. And again, you're, you're in and out of these very, very high powered voice studios. You're working with a lot of great singers, really learning what they need in terms of support from the keyboard. You're learning style every time you play an art song, aria, oratorio, all of those things. And I've learned them first from the keyboard side. Um, and then right after Westminster, they hired me to 
coach and prepare their opera scenes and teach diction, which I did in 2007. I left and got a staff job at Curtis Institute of Music, which I worked for, I worked there for three years on the vocal staff. So I supported, again, playing lessons, playing stagings. Um, and then it was there where I thought, you know, I really want to pursue conducting, but I don't know that anyone's going to take me seriously as a 20 some year old person without a conducting degree. <laughs> Did you feel maybe a little bit objections of how people would see you differently now you're, you, because you were so good at what you were doing? I would say partially, partially so. Um, one thing that I really had to get used to was the fact that when you're in front of an orchestra, the high sounds come out of the left of the conductor. Um, you That's know, true. when it's, when you're, when you're playing the piano, the treble sounds are higher and they come out of your right hand. The orchestra's opposite. <laughs> So that actually took quite a bit, that, that took a bit of quite getting used to. And another thing that, that I had to get used to quickly, and I, and this, this is still, still sometimes the case is, um, I've always been, I feel an incredible listener at the, at the keyboard, which is the, which is the definition of a vocal collaborator. I mean, you're listening all the time and the singer, once he or she, or they are singing, they are in charge. And then also just thinking about you have to command an ensemble of people that are lo looking at one note at a time and then you make the whole. So it was a bit of a jump to under to really understand on a deep level what the how the orchestral players were thinking because it is a different mindset when you're used to looking at either the full score or even a piano reduction when you're looking at the oboe part or the cello part or or whatever. You have to you have to get in their mind too and think exactly what do they need from me they need a clear upbeat they need a clear indication of when to play this accompanied recitative and i think also too a third thing that i would add and i don't know that this was about um going from being a vocal coach to being a conductor i think it was more about my own personality which is that before i wanted to jump into a new thing i wanted to be sure i was ready and that i had all the skills and what was interesting is that some of my um forgive me, but a, a handful of my male colleagues in the profession were less concerned that their skills, th that they were less concerned that their skill set was complete <laughs> and they would just put themselves out there for opportunities. So mm -hmm. I have, I think, and, and I think that's a fine line to walk, right? Because also experience generally shows up right after we need it. <laughs> um, so thinking about, okay, I'm ready. I'm basically ready to start this thing. And then I will learn as I go on this particular project, which actually, I feel like every time we're in front of an ensemble, we are learning as we go. We're learning, even with an ensemble that has played together for a long time. Um, it maybe it's a piece that they don't know. Maybe it's a world premiere. And then all of a sudden you are doing something new with them. Um, and then if it's a pickup group or a pit that, that doesn't play together very often, even with a standard work like Norma, Nozze di Figaro, you're still having, you're having to mold it to that particular cast. Yeah, it's always an adjustment. Yeah, so it's not, I've never found it to be um, something, um, you know, locked and loaded. There is, it, like you, it's, uh, and I'm not, I'm also not saying it's a completely Ikea furniture experience. It's basically together, but then you have to really tweak it and customize it to, um, to what we want, if that makes sense. So Kristen, as you say that you are constantly wearing different hats of a vocal coach and also a conductor, how do you prepare your work? And do you prepare your works differently? Or I'm just really, really curious, like for the arias or opera things that you've been playing for so many times in the past, if you have to now conduct it, do you have to do something to adjust it or? I do. So first of all, when you go from a piano reduction score to a full score, when you make that jump, there is inevitably information that's missing that the, that the full orchestra score does not have. And that can be anything from instruments that are playing or not to passage work that's completely missing, things that double the singers. Um, also uh, other considerations, like for example, there are licks in anything from second violin or viola parts in the Mozart operas, bassoon parts. As a pianist, you might leave out, we won't play everything in a rehearsal. If you play everything, it sounds kind of ridiculous and it becomes not helpful to the staging process or to the coaching process. But in the orchestra, they play everything. 
And you have to consider that these very wonderful individual human beings are playing these parts. If there are tempi that are taken, that are either it makes the tonguing and articulation slightly impossible or bowing, repeated notes, things like that. So you that will inform a tempo that as a pianist will sort of like leave something out and then it gives the singer a false idea of what's possible. So we have to, I think we have to watch that. That's one thing that's definitely a, it, the case when I'm making that transition. Another thing is that having just being used to, from a pianist perspective, I control my own sound. I put the key, I put my hands on the keys and I just play. It's rhythmic, it's percussive, it's immediate. Orchestras, depending on also how close they're sitting to me, how large they are, how deep is the pit, they can respond very, very differently. And um, I haven't yet had the opportunity to work with a lot of European orchestras who generally, generally, especially Northern Europe, um, they tend to play maybe a little behind the beat. It just seems like, you know, they, they play behind the baton. Um, so I've been more used to the playing on the baton or as close to it as possible. Um, that's a big adjustment too, is that the orchestra, when you're starting out, will feel incredibly behind mm -hmm. to someone who has played these scores, who has played these scores a lot. Um, that also being said, I've done a lot working my way up through the ranks of sometimes playing my own rehearsals and then jumping and conducting. And that's actually a process I enjoy a lot because I'm able to be there from the, be I'm there from the beginning and the singers also trust me. So by the time I'm in the pit with the, the orchestra, I've been around the whole staging process. I know where their problems might be because I've been through them with the whole, with the whole thing. And that's a really delightful process actually. Um, and then sometimes also another challenge is that since I keep my cards so close to my vest in terms of playing these scores, when I have a rehearsal pianist who plays it differently, because it's a different human being than I am, period, end of story, I'm always going to be like, Ugh, you know, I wish that was, so sometimes <laughs> I've had to make some, you know, does it really go that way? I don't think so. Um, so I know I can be, I can be particular, but always in the service of the music and always, you know, try to be, you know, the best colleague I can be. Um, with my rehearsal pianists, because I also know what a difficult job that is, um, really including them in the rehearsal process. Cause that I've had so many experiences, both as a repetitor where I feel incredibly ingrained and invited into the process where I have uh, my input about language pronunciation has been welcomed by the conductor. Often my languages are better than the conductor. So I would, I would be tasked to help with that. And I found that really delightful. There have been other times where I literally think the conductor didn't know my name. <laughs> like they, it was like, if I showed up I have and no played, doubt. <laughs> they have, they could have cared less who it was, how well I knew it. Or I mean, just, yeah, you're yeah. the lesser sound orchestra to them. Right. So you're just kind of like a temporary thing. <laughs> it's like, for, it's like furniture, you know, they don't, you know, and, and, if, and in that case, if you, if you don't disrupt the rehearsal process, then you're doing the, in in their mind you're doing you're doing your job uh, your job correctly. So I would say those are all challenges. And then of course, if my life were to ever turn out so I were conducting more symphonic repertoire, I would welcome that. I see the contribution that I'm making more in the operatic and oratorio field. It's I've I've had so much experience doing it. I love it so terribly much. I don't have a dog in the fight about how the bowing is to be done in the second movement of Beethoven Seventh Symphony. Though I love the piece and have studied it, of course, and, and know it, but I don't have strong opinions about it. I have very, very strong opinions about the, the Boeings and the Overture of Cosi Fantute or Nozze di Figaro, for example. I mean, I have very, very, very clear ideas. Because that's just the, that's the rep I, that's, that's where I've lived and where I, I think will continue to live. But, um, so I would say for conductors who are just starting out, if they're coming from a symphonic standpoint, let's say they've played the violin, let's say they played the, you know, the cello, the trumpet, and then they're starting to, oh, they're doing a conducting competition. And in the second round, they have to work with a singer. You know, how do they do that? The first thing is work with a good translation. So really know exactly what the character is saying in two ways. One is that you could say the sentence in your native tongue. The second way is that you know absolutely every word means where are the verbs, where are the adverbs, where are the adjectives, the nouns, mm -hmm. um, the most important words. And then the third thing is what might be difficult or challenging for a singer to pronounce, depending on the, mm -hmm. you know, is it an indication of a fast tempo? Is it something that has to be just rattled off the tongue so fast 
um, maybe in a free way. There are some parts in the accompanied recits of Figaro, for example, that come to mind where um, it, it's a part where it's very easy for the orchestra. The orchestra's holding a chord, but the character speaking has to really, really be quick about articulating something. And then we just have to, we have to support them. And then we have to know when to, when to bring the orchestra back in. So in terms of text, again, translation, and then as much as we can be able to pronounce at least a few, you know, for, for example, I don't speak Russian. It's something I really want to learn. But if I were charged with conducting something like Eugene Onegin, I would, I would go have lessons with Russian speakers and Russian coaches before that project would start. But for someone who is really getting their feet wet into the Italian repertoire, and by the way, for you had asked about what advice to give to people in terms of conducting in the U.S., we do Italian shows still more than anything else. Yeah, uh, we that's still true. that's still the that's still the bread and butter of the repertoire here. So I would say for anyone who wants to get better at operatic conducting, is go to Italy and perhaps if you have four to six weeks go to a language immersion class where you are actually speaking it. And, and also to that end, I would recommend a small to medium sized city because you will be forced to practice the language when you go to the supermercato, when you go to the butcher, when you go to buy your gelato or your vino. What has been lucky actually during my time at Eastman, I was on faculty at this wonderful Italian immersion program, Si Parla Si Canta, so I, I worked there for six weeks, but as part of my salary, I got daily language classes. And then over those period of two summers, I was able to become completely fluent in the language. I, and it, that has really been a great service to my career because when I give singers pronunciation notes, they, they take them. I mean, they, they, um, they respect so what I'm saying. You would actually suggest conductors or anyone interested in knowing more or going to this operatic field to really learn the language as opposed to take an addiction book, learn the IPAs, right? So well, kind of I guess here here's another way to think about it, which is that it's so if you want to have Italian food, you can certainly go to Trader Joe's and I love Trader Joe's, I'm not you know, and you can buy their tortellini and you can buy their sauce and you can buy their pasta, you can you know, you can make it and you can within, depending on what you've purchased within 15 minutes, you can get a pretty decent tasting meal, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> um, but I feel like that is also not how these pieces of music and the libretti were created. These, these pieces of music and these, these giant pieces of language, like again, the, the De Ponte operas of Mozart, those are pieces that are very near and dear to my heart. So I'll, I talk about them a lot. Um, they were created by an Italian whose family was Italian for a long time. And by a composer, certainly Mozart, of course, was not native Italian, but he spoke the language fluently as a young person and had a real gift for language setting. So the Italian, especially in the recitatives, is, it's perfectly set. I mean, the diction books are, those are really important and those are a great first step. And certainly, I mean, I'm a practical person. So if people have, if you have work in the States and you can't afford to, for whatever reason, um, family, money, time, you can't afford to just pack your bags and go to Italy for six weeks and then spend money on a language class. So I, I, you know, I get it. Um, th yes, those are, those are super helpful. The Nico Castell translation volumes are helpful. The um, Evalina Colorni book, The Singing in Italian, which is, uh, that's great. Um, but I think also to go back to the Trader Joe's cooking analogy, these libretti and these pieces of music were created by the equivalent of an Italian grandmother making her own pasta and going out to the going out to the garden and yeah. picking tomatoes from her garden and basil from her garden and cooking it. Um, so one is just from the ground up, um, you know, understanding how the language works. And when when you and I spoke briefly on Friday to to prepare for today's class, another big challenge with the Italian repertoire is that a lot of the repertoire done the libretti is are I mean they're 200 some years old if not older yeah I was gonna bring that up because I uh, my first opera conducting experience was a Haydn Spacandanina and there was ah. no translation available it was an undergrad studio opera project I actually was a last minute assignment because the the other assigned conducting student had 
a thing that he needed to be away. So it was assigned last minute. And、mm-hmm. my teacher was like, okay, you need to learn every single word. So I was like, okay, but I'm having trouble finding <laughs> what those words mean because of the ending changes and it's a tense. And I had, I found myself Googling all the Italian different tenses and the rules and still not getting it. So, yeah, it's like, what it's, would you so, say to people <laughs> in my shoes? Well, that's first of all, that's a very normal, and, and it's funny because for, for how classical singers are trained, they start singing in Italian because generally speaking, the, the, the vowels are clear and pure, and there are less of them than, let's say, in French, which has almost literally triple the amount of vowels that Italian has. So, the Italian pronunciation rules, especially the basics, Um, they can be caught on quite simply, especially also if someone has, let's say, sung in Latin in a choir. Those vowels are very, very close to, the Ita-、uh, to Italian vowels.、Mm-hmm. So that does help. However, the grammar in Italian, especially grammar in antiquated Italian, again, the, the, these Baroque, neoclassical, classical,、um, the reform operas of Gluck, for example, as well,、um, and even the Rossini operas. The grammar is incredibly complicated because you have, you have the issues of the conjugations of the verbs and the nouns get put into the verb, and you don't have separate nouns. You have to understand that that's how it works. The endings are very difficult. So, in terms of the Italian grammar, there are several big, big challenges that that language has. One is that as you're translating, the nouns are often implied in the verb conjugation. So, right away, if you're used to thinking in perhaps English, Or in French or German, all of the, the main words in the sentence appear. You can find the subject, you can find the noun, you can find the verb. With Italian, they're, they're put together. Not only that, then exactly what you said about word endings or what are called the pronomi combinati, which means combined pronouns.、Yes. So all of a sudden, you'll get a, a prefix and a suffix in a verb put together. And then all of a sudden, it's, it's sometimes three or four words in one. So, it's, for someone who is an advanced practitioner of this, I find it challenging. For someone who is doing their very first opera and trying to Google Translate everything, I can't imagine how challenging, the, how challenging that was. That was impossible.、Yeah. And, and very time consuming. And because that work, you mentioned the Haydn opera. It's great music, but it's not done as much. So, the resources that are, for, for example, available for the operas of Handel or Mozart, they wouldn't be available for that. So, you're just doing it, you're, you're kind of doing it on your own. When I was having Italian lessons and we would get to the end of a lesson, and then for any of the coaches that were in the room, the Italian teacher would say, Does anyone want to read to me? You know, so we would have the opportunity to practice our pronunciation or our allocution, and we would start reading, and she would, she would listen to us, and she said, Well, that. That's all pronounced correctly. And she said, half of these words I don't even know. And this was a fluent Italian speaker who had <laughs> advanced degrees from something called the Dante Alighieri Institute, which is the, it would be like the Goethe Institute in, in Italy. It's a, it's a body of work that allows them to teach Italian as a second language or as a, to teach Italian to foreigners. And so these are people who are heavily invested in Italian pedagogy and making sure that people. Are still learning the language well, and even they said, This is very strange, you know, or this is, we don't use that word anymore, we might use this word. And that all of that feedback was so helpful. So, I guess another thing is that,、um, so when I was in Italy and I would have free time, I would take my score, I would go to a bar or a cafe. And Italians, by the way, are very friendly, especially especially the men. Sorry. <laughs> this is like, <laughs> This is, you asked about a, a advantages about being, you know, being a woman or being also a, a, a coach conductor. Well, I will tell you, Italy is, is abundant with people who, if you're sitting having a glass of wine at a bar reading Italian, it's abundant with people who will help you listen to you and pronounce it. <laughs> it's, so I, it will. it's probably a total, totally different story if you were conducting and they're playing under you. But I'm, I'm sure that I've experienced that, that they're really just like open and passionate about talking to strangers. Yes. They just want to help you out. And then I think it's so cute that you're learning Italian. So, so that's another piece of advice I would give to anyone as much as you can travel to the countries where these languages are spoken and then force yourself to speak. I just read this amazing book about、um, 
how to have things be as effortless as possible. It's by Greg McEwen. He says that in order to gain fluency in something, you want to make your first thousand mistakes as quickly as possible, which I thought was super interesting because as classical musicians, part of our training is to, to avoid the mistakes, <laughs> right? Like the, how we practice we're we're trained to avoid them and to practice or and or to practice them enough so they go away right we don't celebrate them enough but he said what you know especially when people are learning languages when if you think about how a kid learns a language or something like that the kids are making mistakes all the time and yeah. they get they get corrected by their parents and the people that are around and them and they learn how to and confident Right. So we need to have that kind of, I think as much as we can have that childlike wonder about the language and the pieces of music that we have, I think that's the sweet spot. I think that's where we need to be going. And I think that's what I bring to the podium. There's so much discovery and there's so much play that has to happen before we even get up to the first rehearsal with the orchestra. As much as singers can have a bad rap, first of all, I love them. I, I, I work with singers more than any other breed of animal. I really just, I just adore them. I, and I love what I get to do. And generally in rehearsal, if things are going well, they tend to be pretty playful. And that's, that's a great energy to take to the podium. Because some conductors are not playful. <laughs> we are very serious creatures, come on. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I felt... It's also opening up now more that we appreciate seeing personalities instead of, mm. or in addition to, you're just good at your job. You're just good at putting things together. You are good at running a very effective and efficient rehearsal, but we now appreciate that personal style more. So ranging from what kind of repertoire you choose, how you address an, a problem, how you solve some conflict even, like you mm-hmm. said, you you have a totally different idea from your rehearsal pianist, which happened. That that's probably us uh, like working with orchestra. So, oh, you play like that. It's totally different tempo yeah. or how I would like that to be done. But that's okay. That's part of this process, and we are now in this all together as um as a part of this creative process. But I love just what you said. So if you are ever tasked like me to learn an opera for a first time where the resources are not readily available, if you want to say as much as you can the written language in Italian and find yourself some Italian coach or even Italian teachers to correct your pronunciation so you really get used to language flowing in your body i found that's like super useful and if you can know every word as much as possible which might sometimes be really challenging especially with italian combining yes. all the i had to decipher which um, pronoun was which because they were like it and he and she when they meant something probably like three four or five sentences before it's very confusing and then also with the um one other layer that's significant is um in the old in the old libretti as well you find a lot of sometimes very obscure references to greek and roman mythology so another thing that i find mm-hmm. myself looking up a lot is um is okay which greek god was this and who who were they married to and what did they do or who did they kill or or, or whatever and then <laughs> why is the librettist referring to this because also what we have to remember is that 200 years ago 250 years ago people buying opera tickets would have studied the main greek and roman myths they would have studied they would have studied them in school and now we you know it's we're so far removed from those which is a shame because they're i think they're very interesting but now we know them because of the names of our planets and the names of the months and we kind of stopped we kind of stopped there. So those, that's another that's another consideration. And it could be another hurdle for someone learning a big opera for the first time. Yeah, I totally feel it. <laughs> yeah. So now I had just like one last question before we close today's episode. What was the one or two things that you wish someone had told you earlier in your career? Um, I would say, first of all, I and this is getting better as I age and as I sort of tend to it. And it, it, this, this bridges back to a comment I made earlier in our, in our chat about being nervous and feeling like I wasn't ready to do something. 
Um, mm. Which is, I think, having a little more courage to to say to either say yes or to ask for things. And I am getting better at that now. Um, you know, now that that I feel a little like slightly more established and slightly more confident in my own skill set. I'm, I feel like I'm more able to be the architect of my own career and say, I'm interested in these things. I want these, I want to manifest these things to happen. I want to do these programs. Um, another thing that I have not, um, I have certainly not given up is my life at the piano. So coming up this year, actually, I have a two disc solo CD that I've gotten a grant to record of song and opera transcriptions. A few years ago, I'd been like, oh, I'm not ready. I don't know if, I, and I was, no, I'm writing the grant. I'm getting it. And I, I, I got it. And so that that's getting recorded in May of 2022. Now, and there is a big difference also, I would say, between confidence and arrogance. I don't want to be the second. I want to be the first. Um, so I would say having more confidence in my own, my own ability, because I, I can be incredibly shy around people, especially around people I don't know. And when you're in front of the orchestra for the first time, it can be like an awkward first date. They're all looking at you and you hope you're saying the right things enough so that they don't hate you <laughs> or something like, you know, something, something like that, where you have to get, you have to finesse a result. Um, I would say that the, that the second thing is to continue for myself to push myself, like to make sure that I have basically that I, that I feel my own growth is in three rings. I have the outer ring of that shows skills I'm very comfortable with and have been for a long time. And then things that I'm working on, the second one, and then the third in the center are things that make me very uncomfortable. Um, mm -hmm. So anything from a new style of music doing it to new language or um, rehearsing in a language I don't really speak and then having to get used to that or, mm -hmm. or, or whatever. And even make sure I'm just also pushing my own body to be the most efficient it, it, it can be in terms of athleticism. Like for example, later on today, I I'm going to go swim laps just to keep, you know, mm. it's, it's the conductor's instrument. Is, the conductor's instrument is just like a singer's. Our, our body is our instrument. So, um, you know, we our have body to and our minds. Yeah, exactly. And our ears too. So we have to, we have to take care of those. So I would say those are probably the, the two, the, the two things that that, yeah, I, that I would say. And I love that you say that. And then we all know that it could be so scary to put yourself out there. And you feel like, especially in, in rehearsal on a podium, like thousands of eyes are looking at you. But yeah. I also wanted to put it out there because there is a study called The Confident Gap, while the study found men would apply for a position if they feel they are 60% qualified, while women tend to apply only if they feel they are 100% qualified. But the thing is, when you don't put yourself out there, people don't know you have great ideas because they don't get to hear them. They don't get to know you. So really, I just want to encourage everyone, no matter men, women, non-binary or transgender, everyone, mm -hmm. every folks, just put yourself out there without being arrogant. Have an open heart and open mind. Be really honest with yourself because you know deep down what are things that you're really good at and what are things like Kristen just said that we're working on or we're not so good or not so comfortable with. But it's okay. We're in this all together. We're always improving. As kind of earlier you said, every time, even with an established orchestra playing figure of for the 200th time right it's a different set of singer it's a different conductor so you have different visions you don't have to be an expert or you don't have to have a thousand followers on instagram to validate your own opinion you, you can still have a say say hey i would like this phrase a little different because that's how i studied the score that's what the language is speaking to me which is totally valid yes yeah and Kristen, I'm so happy for you to come to the show today and we'll put all the um, books and the references in the show notes, but I wanted everybody to hear from you. Where can they find you? Like um, your website or any social media handle if they have I a do. question and want to get in touch. So I have um, the, I, I do have a website, speaking of which that has to be updated. I talk about things that, um, that maintenance of the career, right? Um, the uh, 
I have a, so on there, they can, and my contact info is, is there. I'm on yep. Inst, I'm actually on Instagram these days more than Facebook, but I do check both of those. I'm not very active on Twitter. Um, it's, that's not, that didn't speak to me as much. I like photography as well. So the Instagram stuff actually was, that made, that made sense to me. Um, like how the, how that medium works. Yeah. And then, um, and then also I'm, uh, my full-time job is the, vocal coach and opera conductor at University of New Mexico. So um, if they want to drop me a line, kditlo at unm.edu is a good way to, is a good way to reach me. But really, I, I mean, I check everything. So it's, I'm not that, I'm not that hard to find. Yeah, thank you so much. And we'll link everything to the show notes. So don't worry and go ahead and follow Kristen on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook, or just drop us a note. If you have comments or questions for a future podcast, I'm sure it won't be too long before I invite Kristen back to talk about all the other things that we didn't get to talk today. Thank you, Chowen. Okay, there it is, my friend. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. And thank you so much for tuning in today. If you are studying operatic repertoire for the first time, whether for an aria, a gala, or a full opera, don't forget to always start with the text. Learn the direct translation and meaning of the text in your mother tongue and speak the text of the opera as much as you can, particularly if it's in a language unfamiliar to you. Try to find some help from native speakers or a vocal coach to get as much correct diction as you can under your belt. In your score study, Always consider what might be difficult for the singers and how you can support the singers in your musical decision making. You can always find the resources in our show notes online at chowentame.com forward slash number six. And I will see you again next week at the same time, same place. Oh, and if you haven't subscribed to the podcast, I encourage you to do it right now. You can subscribe on Apple Podcast, Spotify, Google Podcast, or any platform that you are currently using. I don't want you to miss any new episode. Take care and bye for now.